What's going on YouTube fam? Welcome back to the channel. It's your boy Nick here with Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. We're back with another team outlook. This is the last of our NFC East teams. We hit Dallas, we've hit New York, we've hit Washington, which leaves the Philadelphia Eagles. Before we start, I want to thank our sponsors. As always, Monster. And as always, I'll make the same joke that they're not actually our sponsors, but your boy loves Monster, so if anyone who works in Monster watching my video or anyone that knows someone that works in Monster watching my video, think about the fantasy football industry for marketing, bro. We're a bunch of nerd ass people and we could use energy drinks, man. I'm a good sponsor. I'm going to put that at the beginning of every video. Anyways, for these team outlooks, uh, the reason I'm doing all these because we're hitting every single player, every team, all 32 teams, and if you're looking for an outlook on a specific player, Go to my channel, search that team, and they'll be inside that 15 to 20 minute video. Bing, bang, boom. You don't have to search around for sleeper videos, bus videos, things like that. We got every single player covered. So we're hitting the last of the NFC East teams. Today should be a good one. A lot of interesting offseason moves for the Philadelphia Eagles. So without further ado, let's talk some fantasy, baby. When we talk Philly, we're starting off at the quarterback position, obviously Carson Wentz. He was the second overall pick for the Eagles, lit the world on fire for three games. Fire! Started off 3-0. and He posted, let me see these numbers real quick, 769 passing yards, five touchdowns, a donut of an interception over those three games. We're like, oh shit, this mother Hall of Famer already. He's in the books, just retire the guy. The only problem was he played the Browns, the Bears, and the Steelers in those first three games. Nothing against the Steelers, but he had a pretty easy schedule to start the year. And then reality smacked him in the dick. Over the team's final 13 games, they went 4-9. and nine. He turned the ball over 17 times and finished as quarterback 24 in fantasy. He threw up good numbers. It was... Uh, it was a mediocre, but definitely an oppor opportunistic, not I meant optimistic season for, for the rookie in terms of fantasy, in terms of real NFL prospects. Obviously, the Eagles have to be happy with that. Finished with 3,782 yards, 16 touchdowns, 14 interceptions, added 150 yards on the ground along with two scores with his legs. So a good season overall for a rookie, for sure. I'm not anywhere near set on this guy as a real player in terms of both fantasy and real life, more so in fantasy because that's what we're talking now. But Wentz is taking a lot of steps this offseason to improve. He's working with a lot of very well-known trainers. Uh, one of the guys, he's a fan, he's a quarterback guru by the name of Adam Dedo. D-E, what is it? D-E-D-E-A-U-X, however you pronounce that shit, I don't know. So he's trying to clean up his mechanics, which is good because you hear a lot of like veterans that will do this shit like six years into like Blake Bortles or, or other guys that do it like so far into their career. Wentz is getting on top of it now in his second year, which is something I'm optimistic about. Another thing I'm optimistic about is he put up pretty good numbers last year and the supporting cast was so bad. Like, who did he who did he have to work with? Like, the best pairing he had was, like, Doriel Green-Beckham and Nelson Aguilar. I'd rather pair tequila and, and water. So, um, a couple numbers that stood out to me. He ranked 30th in average depth of throw. So, his throws were not far passes. A lot of dump-offs, a lot of running back passes. So, they brought in guys like Alshon Jeffrey, and they brought in guys like Torrey Smith. Obviously, both really good uh, deep threats. Uh, Jeffrey, a much better possession receiver, obviously should increase these numbers for him. And going into the 2017 season, he'll have a fully healthy Zach Ertz and Jordan Matthews. Actually, Jordan Matthews is already fighting knee tendonitis in camp, so that's yet to be seen. But he'll have a lot of his weapons back, and he'll have a lot of new weapons to work with that should increase these numbers. So the pieces are there for uh, progression. The thing that concerns me, though, is that he, he had the fifth most pass attempts of any quarterback in the NFL. He had 607 throws, which is actually the second most in NFL history by any rookie. <coughs> Shout out Big Dog's, uh, Big Dog's dad hat's coming soon in a couple weeks. So stay tuned for those if you want one. Gotta be styling for the summer, right? Like I said, he was fifth in passing attempts, but only 18th in passing yards. He was 25th in passing touchdowns with 16. So the, the efficiency was not there. The volume was. So if he takes a step back in volume, that's going to be a big problem. The efficiency disappearing like a senio. And when you look at the big picture, really when it comes down to it, Wentz broke down in the second half of the year. His mechanics went to shit. He didn't look good. And that's not something that Alshon Jeffrey or Torrey Smith can fix or a healthy Zach Ertz. If your if your mechanics ain't there, they ain't there. Another thing that I look at is you know Carson Wentz is 24 years old. He's not a veteran. So when you're adding all these new pieces into an offense, 
the Alshon Jeffries, the Torrey Smith, those it takes time to get timing down with them and to get chemistry with these new receivers. Yeah, like this isn't Madden where you could just throw one guy in for another and it, it doesn't matter, you know, the dynamics behind it. Chemistry is a real thing, just as continuity is a real thing. It's an intangible that plays into how well teams work together. So they need to put a lot, a lot, a lot of time together this offseason to make sure things click there. And that's another concern because he's a run, uh, he's a young quarterback, you know, and those things are going to take more time than a veteran quarterback doing it. The way I see him overall is he's almost like a, he's very much like a Ryan Tannehill to me. You're going to see glimpses of really good play throughout the year. And you're going to be like, oh, there it is. You know, it's time for him to take that step. And I just don't think he's going to take the step. I don't think he's ever going to be an elite thrower. I know it's so premature for me to say this now, but I guess just talking about next season, I don't see him taking a big jump up from that QB 24 finish fantasy-wise. I do like the rushing floor that he has, and I obviously I like the great weapons. I just think that him as a player overall is not, he's not a great quarterback. Like I said, very much similar to Tannehill. Let me look at his, uh, his ADP right now. He's 133rd off the board right now at QB 18. So that's probably about right. Who's going? Eli Manning's right before him. I would definitely take Eli before him. Blake Bortles is right after him. So is Tannehill. So is Carson Palmer. Um, I would probably take Tannehill and Palmer before I took Wentz. If you're one quarterback team league, I'm not drafting Wentz. So that's that. Let's move on to his weapons. As we talked about, Alshon Jeffrey, basically a one-year prove-it deal. He brings a dynamic to his offense that they haven't had in a long time. He's 6'3", huge target. Uh, he's just 27 years old. He's going to boost that average depth of target for Wentz. He's going to be a legitimate, like, deep possession threat. Wentz's average depth of throw is 7.9. Jeffrey's over the last two years, his average depth of target was 15.3 last year and 15.5 in 2015. Jeffrey can come in there help that. He should also help Wentz's red zone scores. So of all 16 quarterbacks in the NFL with at least 65 red zone attempts, Wentz had the lowest number of touchdowns with 12 of all 16 quarterbacks. So Jeffrey is a great red zone target. His leaping ability, his athleticism, his go up and get it kind of mentality is going to be a really nice fix for this uh, for this offense. It's hard to figure out, you know, who's going to get this many targets. The good thing is they are a high passing volume team. Uh, so they had over 600 attempts last year. Would assume that that number is going to stay around there, maybe drop off by like 20. But Jeffrey should definitely be the easy number one target there. Should see the most targets. I would say um, as a number one target in an offense that has a, a decent amount of weapons, he should see like an 18% to 20% target share there which should give him around 100 to 120 targets. And I think that will safely land him in the wide receiver two category. Definitely a little bit of upside sprinkled in. He's currently going as wide receiver 19, uh, pick 35 overall. So it's not like you're wasting a huge money pick on someone that has big, big upside. Um, so I think that's about the right spot. I think Sammy Watkins is going right before him. And that's a good debate. I would probably take... I'll probably take Jeffrey over Watkins. And then we move on to Torrey Smith, obviously the other free agent they signed this offseason. I can't really see him being anything more than a deep threat. There's these articles written every single year where he's on the Ravens, the 49ers. This worked out. This didn't work out. It's because the quarterback. It's because this, that, and the other thing. Coming off his worst career season in San Francisco, ESPN Eagles reporter Tim McManus put Torrey Smith's over-under this year at 47 catches, 820 yards, and six touchdowns. I will gladly take the under in every single one of those. He's he's going to be a deep threat in this offense. They have the underneath guys in Zach Ertz and Jordan Matthews and Darren Sproles. They have the possession guy in Alshon Jeffrey. Torrey Smith is going to be that deep threat. And I don't see them connecting that much on those because Carson Wentz is, that's, it's not his strong, I mean, he's not, he's not a bad deep thrower, but it's not a strong suit. And I doubt the Eagles will be turning to that. They're more of a, a dink and dump, more of a possession, more of a, um, you know, a move the chains kind of team. So he's more of a boomer bust, like game to game. Why does he have four or five late, late pick and drafts? Then we move along to Jordan Matthews, who's only 24 years old, which is crazy. Now his, his targets and his receptions are going to go down, obviously, with these new weapons in town. He had a really disappointing year last year 73 catches 804 yards just three touchdowns and he finishes wide receiver 51 in fantasy you know those three touchdowns are are a bit of an anomaly because he did score eight touchdowns in both his rookie and sophomore season so i'm not just going to completely write that off as as a complete decline in his play but with all these new red zone targets and all these new weapons overall i, I don't see that number really getting higher than like five or six especially 
because Wentz only threw 16 touchdowns last year, so there's not a lot of room for him to take. He's not going to take 40% of the receiving touchdowns in this offense. Battling knee tendonitis already this year in OTAs, something that I actually battled last offseason. He didn't miss any games because of it, but he's always dealing with nagging lower leg injuries, and you know these, these kind of injuries are what can lead to, like last year, this knee tendonitis might have led to the ankle injury that he suffered. So definitely things to keep an eye on. I don't like Jordan Matthews that much, really, and for where he's going, which is... Let's see, he's going off at wide receiver 41, 93 overall. It's probably about right. You have guys like Rashard Matthews, John Brown, and Mike Wallace are the next three guys off the board. I would probably honestly take all those guys before Matthews. And then when you talk about running backs, Frank Gore is somehow going after him. I The disrespect of Frank Gore is, they need to make a 30 for 30. What if I told you, what if I told you that Frank Gore was an RB2 every single year, but was drafted as an RB7? So those are three receivers that should do any damage in this offense. We'll move over to tight end, Zach Ertz. Now he's had at least 700 receiving yards in three straight years. Only Travis Kelsey, Greg Olson, Delaney Walker are tight ends that are also in that group. He finished 2016 as tight end six in PPR, despite missing two games. He's averaged over seven targets a game over the last two seasons. And he's a pretty good bet to settle around 100 targets. His problem is that he's never scored over four touchdowns, and that's... That's what kind of makes or breaks most tight ends in fantasy. You got to be a high scorer in touchdowns to really hit that elite mark. And I don't see it happening with Alshon Jeffrey coming to town. And what scares me most, I know a lot of people are going to be super high in Ertz and they think he's going to take that like top three to five leap. And he's athletic and he has talent and he can do it. I don't see the opportunity being there. But what scares me the most is the last game of last season. The last game of the year, the Philly played Dallas and Ertz went off. 13 catches, 139 yards and two touchdowns. Great game, obviously. You'd like to see that upside. But that was 50% of his pass, his receiving touchdowns right there in one game and a huge chunk of his fantasy points and fantasy uh, success overall in just one game. I need more consistency out of my tight end. He's being drafted as tight end number nine uh, behind Kyle Rudolph, behind Delaney Walker. He's behind Hunter. I put him ahead of Hunter Henry. I might even put him ahead of Kyle Rudolph. But I think he's actually very, very correctly priced there at uh, tight end nine or ten at a pick 100 overall. So I'm glad he's not shooting up to like the tight end number six right now in drafts. He's a, he's a really good bet to finish as, as a mid to late tight end one. For me overall, what it comes down to the pass catchers is a lot of people are just going to, the, everyone just assumes Carson Wentz is going to take that big step. Alshon Jeffrey is going to be an elite player. Zach Ertz is going to take that huge step. Jordan Matthews is going to be a good player. Torrey Smith is going to have 800 yards. Like the thing is, unless his offense somehow just turns into a juggernaut, everyone can't eat. It's not the way it works. Only like the Patriots or the Packers can pull that kind of stuff off. Same thing with the Dolphins this year. It's like, oh, Tannehill's going to take the next step. Devontae Parker's finally going to bust out. Landry's going to be a top 15 wide receiver again. Jay Ajayi is going to, you know, be the workhorse there and be a top 10 running back again. Julius Thomas is here with Adam Gase, so now he's going to score 15 touchdowns. Like, something's got to give somewhere. Not everybody can just be the best year of all time in the same exact offense, unless you're in a ridiculously good offensive team, which mean, which the Eagles are not. They're good, but something's got to give somewhere. So I think that needs to be priced into ADPs accordingly. So we're done with wide receivers, quarterbacks, tight ends. we got to move over to the ground game, which is, which is kind of a mess here in Philly. They still have Ryan Matthews on their roster, technically, as of when I'm filming this. I, I'm pretty sure all the reports are saying once he passes his physical, they're going to cut him, which leaves 35% of the team's carries from last year's up for grabs. And now they have LeGarrette Blunt, who they signed. They have Wendell Smallwood, who is their second year back. They have Darren Sproles in the mix as well. And they drafted rookie running back Donnell Pumphrey. So a lot of names, but I think I could break it down pretty simply. Smallwood's value takes a huge blow with the LeGarrette Blunt signing. Smallwood's only 5'10", 208 pounds. So his goal line uh, role is completely gone. That's all LeGarrette Blunt. He only scored one time in 83 touches last season. So one, that's a tiny, that's a tiny workload. He didn't, he had nothing. He didn't prove anything last year to me. And two, that's just one touchdown on 83 touches is terrible. He's not as good as a pass and catch, pass catching back as Sproles is. So that knocks off like the two big value points in a fantasy, um, player. So Smallwood's value is, is, uh, he's pretty much undraftable to me. Then you look at the rookie, Donnell Pumphrey. He's I'll give you a little bit of a synopsis on him, like a breakdown. He was the 132nd pick overall by the Philly. I'm not sure what they were thinking here, not drafting a rookie running back. He's 5'8", 176. He's like a knockoff Dexter McCluster. Or I guess he's he's like a comparable Dexter McCluster, which is weird because the the Eagles already have a rich man's Dexter McCluster in Darren Sproles on the team. So I'm not, I don't know. Maybe they're looking, this is, for me, it's more of a dynasty stash. He was highly productive back out of San Diego State University. His small size, he had bad 
combine performance. He definitely has an uphill battle to see any playing time this year, but he's been seeing a lot of play in OTAs at the slot position, which is pretty cool actually, because he's a very athletic player. Mixing him in different spots in the offense makes sense. He's, he's going to have nowhere near enough opportunity to make a fantasy splash this season. He's going undrafted in drafts right now, but he's, he's likely someone you could stash in Dynasty and he'll take over that Sproles role eventually, which is pretty cool. But that leaves us with LeGarrette Blunt and Darren Sproles. And if you watch my sleeper video, Darren Sproles is Easily one of my top, top sleepers heading into 2017. I'll grab him on a ton of leagues. Just go watch that video now. He goes underdrafted every single year. And he produces every single year. Over the last six seasons, he hasn't had a single year under 700 yards, four touchdowns, and 40 receptions. That's huge for PPR. There's no signs of him slowing down. His touches, yards per carry, yards per reception, all increased from 2015 to 2016. So I want you to listen to this. These are his fantasy finishes in PPR leagues over the last five seasons, starting with 2016. RB24, RB28, RB24, RB23, RB13, RB5. That's actually six, not five seasons. So even better. We have a bigger sample size. So his worst finish in PPR is RB28. He's a legit RB2. He's hit or miss on volume, obviously. Game to game, it's hard to predict that. But the numbers don't lie there when you look at where he finishes. He hasn't gone under 40 receptions in any of the last six seasons. Right now, he's being picked at RB44, 148th overall, which is insanity. If his worst finish is RB28 over the last six seasons, why do you have to pick him at RB44? Even if you have to reach up to RB35, you're still getting him at a value. So I absolutely love Sproles. He'll be the primary pass catcher, and he'll get his looks because he was the guy down the stretch last year. So Sproles will take over the pass catching role. We have to look at LeGarrette Blunt, obviously, for the early down role. And I think he's going to be a very underrated player this year in fantasy. Obviously, he had the huge monster year with the Patriots last year, and that was a lot due to the offense as a whole and just the opportunities he got there. He led the league in rushes inside the five yard line, inside the 10, inside the red zone, 18 rushing touchdowns, absolutely dominated the league with that. Blunt should take over Ryan Matthews' role this year. Matthews had 155 carries. The Philly Voices Jim Kemsky put LeGarrette Blunt's carry total for 2017, he put the over under at 170. I think that's accurate, if not low, to be honest with you. I, I think he pushes that 200 yard, uh, that 200 carry mark. Obviously, it's a huge dump off from last season. It's a huge drop off compared to the 300 he had last year um, and in switching the offenses. But something I found very interesting, Ryan Matthews last year, he only had 155 rushes. He had eight rushing touchdowns. And he had 16 rushes inside the five-yard line, which was tied for fourth most in the NFL, even though he didn't have that much opportunity overall. So they used him as a big-time goal linebacker, and Blunt should go right in there. He had, Matthews had 16 carries inside the five, and LeGarrette Blunt dominated the league with those with only 24. So he had eight less, which is a big drop-off, obviously, when you're inside the five, because a lot of those convert. But it's not a huge drop-off. So to... So Blunt sneakily has, a lot of people are going to write him off and say, you know, his touchdown ceiling is now like six because he's not going to get as much opportunity in this offense. But Matthews had tied for the fourth most carries inside the inside the five yard line last year. So Blunt's going to take that role and he has sneaky, sneaky, very high touchdown upside. So between 175, 200 carries, a lot of goal line looks. I really like Blunt as a value this year. He's going, where's he going right now? I have it written down here. He's going 110th overall, running back 33. So he's getting picked as, a, as an RB4. I would be perfectly happy with him as my RB4 in my team. As someone, He's going to start. He's going to be the starter there in, in Philly. He's going to get the early down work and a lot of goal line work. So I'm, I'm, I'm freaking pumped up about that. Two sleepers I like in this backfield. Whoever's getting the rock, they're going to be behind. A pretty good run blocking line. They were 13th in the NFL. Uh, as ranked per football outsiders. So it, it's a good situation overall. And I like uh, I like this offense to take a step forward this year. So that's going to wrap it up for the Philadelphia Eagles. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please give it that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Share it. Do whatever you got to do. You can check out the blog post. Everything will be linked below. And uh, we will be back sometime this weekend, next week. I don't know. I'm not even sure when this video is going to go up. But again, I hope you enjoyed. Answer me this. Who would you rather have half-point PPR, Darren Sproles or LeGarrette Blunt straight up? I would go... I'd go LeGarrette Blunt, definitely, but... Eh, maybe y'all disagree. Peace. I invented sweat. Popping bottles, putting supermodels in a cab. Proof. I guess I got my swagger back. Truth. New watch alert. Man, man, man. New blows. Or the big face rollie I got.